1906, in which she really takes apart the way in which imperialism functions economically and what it had to do in order for it to spread across the world. The uh, section I really recommend is section three. It's really worth reading. If you have, like me, bad eyes uh, and so on, yeah, there's a really good audible version of, of it as well, so you can listen to it while you're walking your dog, which is what I do. But section three of Roblox and Capital, uh, uh -huh. Capital she, this, she really pins down the way in which uh, Western capital begins to uh, conquer the rest of the world. She talks in detail about Algeria, and when you read the sections on Algeria, <coughs> you can't stop by thinking about Palestine. The way in which Arab lands were taken, lands that belonged to Arab families, and given over to uh, a colonial settlement. She talks in detail about China, and the way in which the uh, 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 capital smashes up this old system and uh, plunges uh, the country into poverty. She talks about a lot also about India, the way in which uh, uh, British imperialism uh, dismantles uh, uh, whole sections of the Indian economy and essentially loots uh, uh, everything for it. And she really spends a lot of time on Egypt, which is really worth, again, really worth reading. Uh, the central part of what Rosa Luxemburg talks about is the way in which uh, uh, capital, as it begins, capital as it begins to really develop inside of the Western world, inside of its centers, if, if you like, finds itself more and more constrained inside its own national borders. Uh, there's a whole series of uh, big formulas she put forward, which I'm not going to try, try uh, uh, to talk about now. But for an order for capital to expand, it had to go beyond and, and begin to look at what it can conquer. And she talks a lot. Uh, in the book, that's when she calls natural economies, which are the the, the, the social systems that this this uh, uh, expansion uh, capitalism comes in contact with, and what is it that it has to do? So she talks about the way in which it has to break the old social relations, which in lots of parts of the world involve uh, peasantry. In the Arab world specifically, and she talks about this a lot in Algeria, is the what are known as uh, the, uh, the common lands. Uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the Levant, we call them the, the Mishat, which is the, that most land was owned by village communities. Uh, it was owned in common. And that the uh, land was distributed year to year between different families. So one year you might have grazing rice, another year you can plant, and so on. So it was quite an equal, uh, 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 a primitive, what she calls primitive communist style organization. The land the majority of the people who lived in the Levant and, and in Egypt and so on in these areas was owned by villages that were on top of them, uh, that, 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 that grew up around them. This form of ownership was, of course, completely alien to uh, capitalism. And what British and French capital did was simply reproduce what they did in their own countries to then export this to the rest of the world. And of course, when we talk about what happened inside of England, we talk about enclosures the seizure of the common land of the peasants, the same thing happened in France, and so on. So it was, if you like, the, the forcing of uh, common property into private property, the pushing of people off the lands into cities and so on has been quite an important process. So they wanted to reproduce this in the country, in the areas and, and the lands that they, uh, that, they, that, they, that they took over. Uh, they, they, they get this uh, uh, opportunity with the beginning of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, something known as the, the capitulations, where Western capital begins to get concessions in order to operate inside of uh, the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire at this point went, you know, through to Egypt, Iraq, uh, the, the, the Levant, all the way through to sexual, you know, areas of Greece and the Balkans, uh, 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 and so on. And this comes to the second point that Rosa Luxemburg makes, I think, really well. And she talks about, specifically here, she's talking about German capital. And, uh, the Deutsche Bank and Siemens, funny enough, they're still around. Mm. And she says that that uh, the they they make a deal with the Ottoman authorities to drive a railway line through Ottoman areas, and 50 miles either side of the railway line. So you imagine a railway line is quite thin. As it goes, 50 miles either side of that now is the property of the railway companies. How will they pay for this? They pay for this by the Ottoman authorities taking seizing taxes and grain from the peasantry, selling it as a commodity, and then paying the Germans back for the investment they put in. So capitalism, if you like, imperialism inside the Middle East enters on these two points. One is on what they call capital investment, which is paid for by the people itself, 
And the second one is the beginning of the way in which they can seize the common lands, take over uh, areas of fertile crescent, and so on. This, this, this becomes a really important. The third, I think, really important point, and we have to keep coming back to that, and funnily enough, we don't need to be reminded of it, is the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal, which completely revolutionizes uh, two things. One is it gives whoever controls the Suez Canal, at this point it was Britain, uh, has, if you like, the shortcut to the Far East, to the uh, Chinese markets, to India, more, more importantly, and so on. Uh, 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 and, and in so doing, this becomes, if you like, the battle, a new battleground. There is a big fight between France and Britain over who controls the Suez Canal, and so on, the, during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, I, 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 and after. And again, to pay for the Suez Canal, they seize huge areas of land, uh, sell it off to private investors, and so on. So you, so, so you have, if you like, all these things beginning to, or all these things uh, begin to, 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 to take place. 1922, after, after the First World War, 1922, the French take over Syria and what will become known as Lebanon. They bring in a law which basically refuses to recognize any common property and they begin to sell off these properties to tax collectors from the former Ottoman Empire, but also to a newly rising kind of local ruling class. In Lebanon, it was 200 families. 200 families pretty much took control over the, the whole of the land. But it would be, well, when I talk about 200 families, I'm also talking about my family. So my great-grandfather uh, made some money in the US in the late 1890s, comes back up to the Second World, up the First World War, and simply buys, <laughs> simply buys the whole village. So that's that. That's, in, in that sense, the, create, the French are creating a new bourgeoisie, if you like, a new class of landowners from within the community itself. The rest of the family were really pissed off with him. Actually, when he died, they refused to bury him in the village, which is you know, still, still a big shame for, 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 for us. But he was actually, as they say, a son of the village who, who took over. What happened in Palestine? In Palestine, the British did exactly the same thing. But instead of selling the land, instead of selling the land to create a new Palestinian bourgeoisie or a new layer of Palestinian, they simply sell it to, to uh, Zionist settlers. So Zionism then appears, if you like, inside of, of, of Palestine at the same time mm. as this is taking place in the rest of the Middle East, the seizure of lands, property, and so on. Inside of Palestine, it becomes an exclusive right of Jewish immigrants. So this, you then begin to see uh, the arrival of, uh, the arrival, if you like, of a kind of uh, uh, a proto-apartheid uh, 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 settlement. And why was it the British need to do, to do this? One is, what they found in their rule in Egypt was the Egyptians are not very cooperative. They tend to have revolutions every 20 or 30 years. And there was a very famous one in the 1880s, which really scared the living pants off them. Uh, a, a, a massive uprising. This fear of the Egyptian revolution kept, was, kept repeating. It kept repeating. And so they, uh, the British needed, if you like, something to control or to punish Egypt, but something to control the northern end of, of, the, of, of the Suez Canal. The most important place being Jerusalem at the time was the crossroads, if you like, of, 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 uh, of railways and so on. So if you grab Jerusalem, if you grab Haifa, which is the most important port, then you have control, if you like, to split the Arab world in two, uh, and you'd always have uh, what the British described as a loyal little Ulster in a sea of hostile Arabism. This is a quote from uh, a Tory MP at the time. If you think, well, what does this mean? It means that they want to recreate what happened in Ireland, the splitting of Ireland inside of the Arab world. They're loyal to Ulster, people will be dependent on us in a sea of hostile Arabism. That is, to create, if you like, a settler state, uh, and this settler state will be always, always in the debt of imperialism. And Tony Cliff put it really well. Uh, Tony Cliff is the founder of the party, who uh, uh, I will recommend a few of his articles, actually. Um, he, 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 he put it really well in terms of that the, the Zionism was not for sale. Zionism was for hire. You have to find, if you like, who was the dominant imperial power and then offer itself up as the gendarme for imperial, the watchdog, if you like, for, 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 for imperial, uh, imperial interest. The British take control of Palestine. They start seizing the whole of the land. They sell, they give this land usually to Ottoman uh, tax collectors and various others who immediately sell it exclusively to Jewish organizations who then simply go through, with the help of the British Army, clearing out. You begin the process of the Nakba, then begins the slow clearing out of, 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 of our, uh, of, of our, our uh, population. When they tried to do this in Syria, by this I mean Greater Syria, uh, which included Lebanon at the time, there was a massive uprising. 1926, known as the Syrian Revolution, 
the massive uprising that takes place inside of Syria. The French are pretty much broken by this uprising, so they retreat and carve out a small section of, of, of Syria uh, that we now know as Lebanon. And in so doing, they break the economic centers of Syria. So when we talk about the, the, the southern port of, of Saida, which is in, in, in South Lebanon, this was the main port of Damascus. Our northern port, Tripoli, which is just in the north of Lebanon, this was the main port for Aleppo. So they, when they came in and they broke Lebanon from Syria, they economically broke Syria uh, uh, from the, the outside world, but they failed to subdue Syria. So then you, be, you, be, you begin to have really the process of the Syrian revolution that, that continues really a, it, it a fantastic uh, flowering of Arab thought and so on that takes place until uh, the Ba'athist coup smashes pretty much uh, uh, smashes everything up. The, so you have now the, if, if, if you like, uh, this other force beginning to, 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 to take interest. So you have, after the First World War, the splitting up of the Middle East between the French and the British. And uh, the Americans came in late, so we need to give the Americans something. Uh, we'll, we'll give them that bit of desert that no one knows anything about, uh, which has just been taken over by uh, the, Saudi, uh, the, the Saudi family. Saudi family wasn't the original. The original was the King of Jordan was supposed to be running Saudi Arabia. I don't know if people know this. And he was driven out by the Wahhabi the Islamists, <laughs> and, and he, he, he was given Jordan uh, as a compensation. Actually, the US was seen very much as a marginal. So they were given the marginal. What turned out, actually, was they were given the mother load. It turned out, actually, in Saudi Arabia had much more oil uh, than, the, uh, than, than, uh, than, than Iraq or, 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 or Iran, and it's cheap and good quality. So the, when the Americans start coming in, what is their position? Their position is pro-Arab. And you read the stuff from Aramco, the Arab American Oil Company, it's all pro-Arab. Actually, uh, for a, a lot of Americans, Israel was some kind of socialist beast. They had kibbutzes and property and all this kind of stuff. And there was a real hostility, uh, real hostility towards it. And when in 1956, Britain and France, with Israel, attempt to smash the uh, Gamal al Nasser, who just led a revolution, a nationalist revolution inside of Egypt, he nationalizes the Suez Canal, he throws out the the, the, the British and French companies. Britain and France then attempt to invade with the Israelis. What do the Americans do? They pull the plug on uh, Britain and France. They destroy their attempt to, to, to reconquer Egypt and present themselves as the saviors of, uh, uh, of, of the saviors of the Arab world. Why? Well, we're pro-Arab. There's another aspect of this which is really important, was the American oil companies had no interest in going to Saudi Arabia. They had, enough, they had enough oil come from Texas and California and so on. What do we need to go halfway around the world? They had to be dragged there by the, by the US state. It wasn't that they were already going for there. They were dragged there because the Americans begin to understand the economic significance of it. And the oil that then comes from Saudi Arabia really it was known as the super profits. All the time when I was young, it was simply known as the super profits. It was, if you like, just a dollar machine for the, uh, for, for, for the American uh, for, for the American, uh, for, for the American economy and American imperialism. Then 1967 happened. 1967, the Israelis launch a preemptive strike on Syria, uh, Jordan, and on, uh, on, on 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 Egypt, without the knowledge or the blessing of the U.S., France, or Britain. In fact, there's a story of the American ship being sunk by the by the Israeli Air Force at the time. I know there's lots of conspiracy theories about this, but it, it, it actually happened because they didn't want them to know. They didn't trust them. What America was happening, what was happening to America at the time was they were in a massive quagmire inside of Vietnam. And when Israel showed its ability militarily to punish Egypt, punish Syria, they said, what, where our allies have let us down in Vietnam and the Far East, the Israelis have proved what we can do inside of the Middle East. So from 1967, the Americans become the main supporters, if you like, the main funders of Israel as its watchdog. Now, it was its watchdog. Uh, and defeating Egypt in 1973, 1973 war, defeating Syria in 1973 war, really brought uh, 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 the, the importance of, of, uh, of, of Israel to, to imperialism. Here was a nation that was capable, on its own, of defeating two or three Arab armies 10, 15 times bigger than they were, etc. Uh, 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 etc. Et so, they, so they begin to really, really back it and see it as being really important. Then there's another very decisive event, 1979 Iranian Revolution. 1979 Iranian Revolution, 
pulls from America, one of its greatest allies in, uh, in, in, inside the, the Middle East, the royal regime, the uh, uh, Pahlavi regime inside of Iran, is overthrown. So suddenly the Americans are finding themselves with less allies than they did before, with less capabilities of, of, taking, of keeping control of the oil and so on than they did before. Israel suddenly becomes really important. The more trouble imperialism becomes in the Middle East, the more important they begin to see uh, Israel as its, uh, as its, uh, as its weapon to, 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 to punish, the, uh, to, to punish the, the Arab world. And of course, this process of, the, this process of development begins to transform the Arab world. I was always told, I, I come from, I'm 60, right, just to tell you, so I've been around for a bit. I remember 1967, that's how old I am, right? But, so my dad is obviously much older, he was born in the 1930s, and he always used to tell this joke, because uh, of, of when the Saudis first got money, he goes, oh, yeah, the Saudis, he said, they don't, they're not like us, you know, they're one time people, we're, you know, we're educated and so on. These people are just like Bedouins, you know, what do they know? They buy a car, fill it with petrol, it runs out of gas, and then they abandon it because they think it's broken. Everyone laughs, oh, the Saudis, they're so stupid, and so on, et cetera, et cetera. And look how they sold their country to the Americans, la, la, la. So you look at the Saudi Arabia in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, to Saudi Arabia today. Saudi Arabia today is the center of Khadiji capitalism. It is extraordinarily wealthy. You talk about, when they talk about their sovereign fund of being nearly a trillion dollars, that the Arab American oil company, which was simply a front for US oil back in the 50s, 60s, from the 1970s, now is wholly owned by the Saudi regime. Not only do they all now own the oil, but they own stuff downstream as well. So it's become, if you like, the rise of the Gulf states is no longer now as a, a servant of imperialism, but actually a <coughs> functional members of the global ruling class. So you have uh, you know, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, uh, Bahrain, and so on, using all this wealth to create, if you like, this, 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 this growth of, uh, uh, of, of, of Khaliji Arab, 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 Arab capital, and how the, the Arab world has completely changed. In 1948, we essentially had well-trained uh, British and American and French and so on settlers coming, who'd come from usually from the Second World War, already knew military stuff, were already well educated against a whole bunch of peasants, led mainly by aristocratic officers, a complete sham of the Arab army. It was a complete sham of, 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 of an Arab army. When I was growing up, 11 and 1960s and early 1970s, 80% of the population still lived in the village. Now, 90% of the population live in cities. There's been a complete transformation, it's not simply in Lebanon, but a complete transformation of social relations inside the whole of the Arab world. So the difference between the state uh, social relations in 1948 and social relations now are completely and fundamentally different. So the world has uh, changed, uh, the, the world has changed uh, 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 very dramatically to the state that now you have, if you like, a retreat, bloody retreat, but a retreat nonetheless of US imperialism. They're, when you think they were as far as Afghanistan only a few years ago, and now it's lucky that they hang on to Jordan, really, you, you can see how the, uh, uh, the the front line has shifted. The complete disaster of the Iraqi occupation, where essentially they demolish the, the, the Ba'athist regime in Iraq, and in so doing, remove the counterweight to Iran. It was, you know, it was really a strategic blunder of quite historical uh, proportions. They were having to retreat from Iraq, uh, and so Israel becomes much more important. So Israel is more important now the more isolated they are from the, uh, from, from, from the rest of the, uh, from the uh, rest of the Arab world. But it's also raised a second thing, which is now we can start talking about regional sub-imperialisms. It's not the same as the big, so imperialism isn't simply one country acting shittily. It's a social <laughs> system, uh, uh, a system of, of global capitalism, in which there are lots of different players. Some are stronger, some are weaker, some are getting stronger, like China, some are getting weaker, like Russia, and so on. Uh, but now there's also the rise of sub-imperialism inside of it. Iran being, of course, very important. Turkey growing massively in, in, its, in, in its power, and now beginning to export its capital as well uh, into uh, northern Iraq and, uh, 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 and so on. Israel, of course, quite important. Some so now you have, if you like, a uh, retreat or a shaking, if you like, of, uh, uh, of the big imperial powers. Inside of that rising regional powers with all their different interests, and sometimes they are, uh, you know, uh, so sometimes they line up with one or other regional power, and at another point, they, they don't, they, they, they're against it. And more crucially, I think, for the Americans, and the big fear the Americans have is the arrival of China in a really fundamental way. 
I always tell the story because it makes me laugh. <laughs> uh, 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 which is, I, I was a journalist. Yeah, five minutes. I, have a, uh, I was a journalist in uh, before the between 2000 and 2004 in Lebanon, working on an English newspaper in Lebanon. And uh, we were linked with the New York Times, so every now and then the American embassy would come to visit. They'd come to visit what they call soft power to shake the editor's hand. Actually, they just played a shaft at the editor. That doesn't really matter. So it was that kind of thing. When the American embassy was coming, we weren't allowed to stay in the building. Everyone had to leave the building. The Americans were terrified. <coughs> even, even, even just you know, a bunch of journos. No Arabs around, because you never know what we're going to do. <laughs> what we'd like to do, and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so they said, empty the building. Uh, the Americans are coming, oh, OK, everybody goes to, a, you know, drinks coffee and plays uh, backgammon for a while, and then they leave, and then everybody goes back to it. Back to it. The Chinese came, they just wandered around the room. No one was burning Chinese flags. China was not seen as the Americans were seen. And so you begin to see the appearance, if you like, of China in a really significant way, First, because of goodwill, because they have no interest they see, people see no interest uh, that, that, that they're having, but also the way in which China has slipped in without almost the Americans noticing. One of the biggest winners of the Iraq war were Chinese oil companies, because the Americans didn't really get very much out of it. Uh, the uh, uh, Chinese foreign minister appears in Tehran, orders the Iranian uh, foreign minister and the Saudi foreign minister, these two countries at the verge of war, orders them to Beijing, makes a deal. They make a deal before the State Department, the US even knows that anything is happening. <laughs> so the, the Chinese are slipping in and beginning to, if you like, replace the US. So mm. the state the US has is very, very shaky and becoming shakier and shakier. And in so doing, becoming more and more desperate and more and more, uh, more, and more violent. There's, there's nothing, I mean, just reading the newspaper for the last couple of days gives you really the kind of, the, uh, the, the idea of this kind of petulant and impotent organization the US military. It's petulant because they, they were telling us they flew, they flew jet planes all the way from the US to bomb empty buildings in Syria, because of course the Iranians, got, the Iranians moved everyone out, they knew it was coming, to, 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 to bomb uh, empty buildings. And at the end of it, nothing has changed. So, they're, so, so, so they're, they're, they're throwing away their military, they're throwing around their military weight, but still unable to get the Houthis to stop firing themselves at ships, to, st to, to stop the Iraqis from demanding that all their troops leave, all the American troops leave, leave Iraq, and to stop actually <coughs> this creeping, uh, 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 cre 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 creeping disaster of American imperialism. And I, I will finish with this and another story, which is I also, my, my grandmother's house in the village, she had a, a, an old tin of oil with the American flag on it. It says, and on, on it said, and she you know, grew up plants in it. And I said, you know, Tita, why, why do you have to see it, you know? I said, you know, friendship to the to Lebanese people from, from the U.S. And she goes, oh, you know, when the Americans first came, we thought, what could be worse than the British and the French? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That she, she was born on the, under the Ottoman Empire. But she said, you know, also, when the British and French came, we said, what can be worse than the Ottoman Empire? <laughs> well, actually, it gets worse and worse. So now we start asking you about China. Well, what can be worse than the American Empire when China's coming? Oh, they must be better. Really? Are they better? Or are they just another imperialism? coming, what is it they want? Actually, they want oil, they want control of the Suez Canal, and so on. And so we have to understand that, that the Middle East as a battleground for imperialism uh, over a historical period and over the period where we are now. And I will, I will finish with this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, which is something I saw yesterday, which, which I think really touched something really deep down inside. There have been uh, images of starving Palestinian children walking up to Egyptian troops, sitting in their tower blocks, asking them to throw a biscuit. Mm. Bad luck, throw a biscuit. Mm. Going along the fences, tucking the fences, bad luck, just give, give us a biscuit. Mm. So what is the reaction of the Egyptian military dictatorship? They've now built a wall between the Egyptian troops and the starving Palestinian children. Mm. And this is, if you like, the reaction, this is the reaction to the genocide. We don't want our troops to have to suffer watching the Palestinian children. Uh, dying of hunger, but more importantly, we're really worried what this message of hunger to conscripted Egyptian troops means going back. And you talk to Egyptian comrades, and they talk about the situation of being like this inside of Egypt, being like this. And I think the same is true inside of Jordan, the same true inside of Lebanon. Uh, and uh, to conclude, uh, just just to say that the the that we have never been in a situation. You know, there's more workers today 
in South Korea's little finger than there was in the whole world during Marx's time. And actually, if you look at the Arab world, it's massive working class. There's a massive working class. And we saw it shake in 2011. We saw it shake the buildings, but not go further. We're now beginning to feel the rumbles, I think, coming from underneath, uh, from, 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 from underneath uh, as well. And just this book. I wrote lots of accumulation of capital. It's really heavy. It's really heavy going. I'm not going to lie, it's really heavy going. Uh, I, the way I got around it was to listen to an audible, which is mm -hmm. a really good way of actually doing it. That is, uh, again, really, I think, just really clarified so many, uh, so many th things for me. And I know there's huge debates around it still and so on, uh, but I do really recommend it, especially now since the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Germany have turned out to be a bunch of. Imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> Politically <laughs> correct term. Um, uh, so, the, the, the fight, so the fight over Rosa Luxemburg's ideas at the moment in the Arab world actually is quite sharp. So I just think um, we, 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 should, we should read it. Her, her analysis of imperialism, the mechanics of imperialism, I think is so, it, 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 it's so important and really, really, really good. There's a second thing I recommend you read by a, a Luxembourgist, a man called Tony Cliff, which was written in Jerusalem in 1945. And if I just read you, this is uh, it's called uh, Middle East at the Crossroads. So this is, the, if you like, the first statement of the strategy of the IS, because uh, Tony Cliff um, <laughs> was born in uh, was born in Palestine uh, in 1917, and, and I, I, I read it. I was going to recommend it to read it to understand how where our tradition comes from. But just the first few lines tells you everything. The events in the last few weeks in the Middle East have drawn attention to the whole world and what is happening in this region. The terroristic acts of Zionist, Zionist military occupation. The strikes and demonstrations of the Arab masses in Cairo, Alexandria, Damascus, Beirut, Baghdad against Zionism, and the concentration of British troops in Palestine has, arose, has aroused numerous questions. Uh, the answer is in one word, imperialism. So this is the, the, the beginning of it, if you like. And I really recommend you read this because it really begins to place it and to, to, to understand where our tradition comes from. And our tradition comes from Palestine. I like to say this to everyone. Uh, uh, this, this is where it comes from. Um, the rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Israel, interestingly, the rapprochement is taking on a very physical form at the moment, is that because the Red Sea is now closed to everyone apart from Chinese shipping, <laughs> and you know this, <laughs> sorry, I had to throw a joke in here, apparently, apparently the, the Chinese sailors have been tweeting as they pass through the, the Red Sea, going, oh, it's a beautiful journey, we really enjoy the music, uh, uh, but the, the, the Saudis and the Jordans have opened uh, a road between so they're unloading Israeli produce in Saudi Arabia and just driving it by road through Saudi Arabia uh, into Jordan. So, so the rapprochement is physical. It is, 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 is actually happening. Uh, and the second question about the, the land under, under the Ottoman Empire, which, which is absolutely correct. And it just reminded me of the difference between Palestine and Iraq. Because in Iraq, they didn't do this. They just killed the Ottoman tax collectors when they came. The Iraqis had this kind of really good tradition of resistance. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so in the Levant, we had to lie. In, 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 in Iraq, they should have killed them. And they uh, and, you know, there's a difference between Iraqi resistance and uh, Syrian Lebanese Palestinian resistance. That goes all the way back. Just the question of the BRICS, which is a serious one. Because it raises this idea that there is this other formation that can act as a counterweight to the dominance of the US dollar. And it's an important one, because the dominance of the US dollar is, is going down. Uh, the idea, and, and the panic inside the US administration is that if there is a system outside of the dominance of the dollar, then sanctions no longer work, because you simply now be able to. So we're beginning to see this now, in the way in which uh, the, uh, the Iran Iranians are receiving oil, oil payments in rubles, or the renminbi, sorry, the, 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 the Chinese currency, and so on. So you begin to see this. And you can look and you can go, the Chinese economy is as big, nearly as big as the American economy. You go, oh, that's it. Chinese economy is as big as the American economy. But then you think, well, but who have the Americans got on their side? The so Chinese economy is very big. The Brazilian economy is very big. South Africa, the BRICS, they are quite big economies. But what's on the American side? <laughs> you see the size of the American economy, then there, of course, is the European Union as well, and of course there's Japan, and as soon as you see that, you start realizing actually, even though the BRICS are, represent a threat, actually the size of the Western uh, <coughs> power economy is massive compared to, even with China, even though China is, is rising massively, it's nowhere near the levels at which uh, the, the, the US is, but it is a threat. And what's really interesting, and, and this is why 
I'm making this important not to put anything inside of China. The Chinese uh, asked for a port in Djibouti, which is just on the mouth of the Red Sea, uh, to help uh, uh, you know, with some of their shipping. And it was described, I think, by an American <coughs> observer as watching one of those, uh, uh, one of those speeded up uh, 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 films of a flower blooming, yeah? You know the ones I mean, where you see. They said, we were watching a satellite thing, and said, we watched this one pier, and somebody goes, <laughs> followed by a second pier, and said, well, within, within like two or three months, they had this huge military base. And suddenly, the Chinese are in the mouth of the, of, of, of the Red Sea. And they say, okay, what else is going on? What's happening in Port Said and Suez? Two important cities in Egypt. One at the Mediterranean, top of the Suez Canal, one at the mouth of the Suez Canal. Massive industrial investment. Where's the investment coming from? China. So, so what is going on here? Is it the Chinese are coming to rescue the Palestinians? No. What's happening is the Chinese are moving their Belt and Roads and now have manufacturing hubs that they are investing in heavily because, not that they want to cut the Suez Canal, but actually this becomes really, this becomes like the reverse, if you like, of the British. They need the Suez Canal now in order to open up the markets for, uh, really important markets for, 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 for the European uh, for the European Union, to the extent the other day when the um, uh, 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 when the when the when the West cut all the funding to uh, the the UN agency, um, people in the Arab world are going, well, come on, China, you can now become the sponsors of the Palestinian people, and there's just a silence from the regime. You know, some, you know, we, you know, we we have no interest really. Our interest is that now most of our oil comes from Saudi Arabia and from Iran. Make sure that's safe, and also a lot of our investment. Uh, in, in, in downstream processing is now going to take place in Egypt, uh, but we also need to be able to go through the Suez Canal so we can get the market. So uh, China arriving with the rise of the BRICS or the rise of the other, even though I'd love seeing Americans get slapped, you know, it's like, what can be worse than the Ottomans? What can be worse than the French? What can be worse than the Americans? Well, maybe they'll be worse. So we don't know. What we don't want is simply another imperial power coming in saying how nice we are and and, 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 and we don't carry the same weight as they did, uh, as they did before. Um, and there's a question just of the mutinies, uh, raised the question of mutinies. It apparently wasn't a mutiny. Apparently what happened was that the Israelis decided they wanted to seize what's known as the Philadelphia Road. Philadelphia Road is the road that runs into uh, South Gaza, which is under the nominal control of the Egyptian army, which is where all the aid truck, trucks are, where people see the pictures. And the Israelis decided they wanted to take that over and the Egyptian army said that they couldn't until there was a confederation between the Egyptian army and the, uh, and the Israeli army, of which apparently they said that uh, helicopter gunships were involved. So obviously the, it was a big you know, uh, type of standoff and the Israelis uh, backed down. It could be that this was done locally, we don't know, or it could be that actually the Mubarak, the, Mubarak, the, the al-Sisi regime is so panicked. And you talk to Egyptians, they talk about this almost almost craziness that there is inside the, the, the Egyptian system in which there is now no longer a buffer between the people and the regime. You had the Muslim Brotherhood, you had various social organizations, you had Arab nationalist reformists that could always absorb a certain amount of anger inside of Egypt and so on and direct it towards reforms. This now no longer exists. The, the Sisi regime destroyed it. So there's this gulf now between the regime that's getting tighter and tighter and a more and more threat and this kind of mass of population in which now they have almost no influence almost no influence over it, not to mention Jordan, where they, they are, uh, they are, the amount of arrests that are taking place, there are 11 million people in Jordan. Uh, Jordan is a Western ally and has been since its very inception. It's a prison house for Palestinian refugees uh, and it is ruled with a rod of iron. And we talk about something, I think in the first couple of weeks, 800 people being arrested uh, and word coming out that they're using Israeli technology to spy on people and arresting people and they are terrifying. When you have huge crowds running through the capital of Amman chanting uh, Abu Obeidah, who's the head of Hamas military, uh, give us your command and we will order you, you know, we will, we will follow your command. You can, see the sh you can see the fear that there is, because there's 11 million people, and it's not nothing. It's quite important and actually uh, a key to the, uh, to, to, to the West Bank. It's the key to the West Bank, Jordan. It's right next to it. It's, like, it's like 20 miles away. You can stand in Jordan and look into Palestine. You can stand in Lebanon and look into Palestine as well. Actually, for, for that matter, it's how nervous how nervous the regimes are to the extent that they pull the Queen on TV to, you know, express the uh, anger at the killing of children. Or you can really feel you, you can really feel it. And so we don't know what's going to happen, but we know something's going to happen. 
Mm -hmm. uh, just a question on the working class in the, in the Khaliji. Uh, yeah, the, uh, it's, mainly, it's mainly imported. Uh, and there are very few Arab workers now in, in inside, inside Israel. Uh, since the uh, second father, uh, pretty much uh, the wall's going up, they're pretty much destroyed, whatever. They used to put in a lot of Palestinian labor, but now they, 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 they simply don't. And I saw a picture yesterday of uh, poor Indian laborers queuing up to get a visa to work in South Israel, so that they, use, they will use people constantly to, to uh, to, 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 to try and, uh, and undermine it. And the, this, I think, marks the big difference between South Africa and Israel. In South Africa, we had, you had our apartheid regime, uh, which was trying to control a phenomenally huge working class, uh, miners and so on. Uh, and, and the anti-apartheid movement, the deeper it got into the work, in South African working class, uh, uh, the stairways they used to call it, kind of general strikes that would take place, actually made it more and more difficult. There isn't that same dynamic inside of, uh, inside, of, uh, inside of Israel, unless you look just outside of its borders and go, well, where is the big working class? Well, it's in Egypt, and in Jordan, and in Lebanon, and it's millions strong, and it's very, very strong. So there are elements of it which are the same elements of it which are different. And, and my generation really were radicalized, I think, by two events. One was the first intifada, uh, which was the overcoming of the defeat for us at the time, the defeat of 1982, the defeat of the left, da-da-da-da. First intifada breaks out.